Good morning. Welcome back to semantics. Today we are going to start uh, inferences and semantic relations and some properties. So this is where the real bulk of the course starts. And I'm sure this is where you'll start having some questions about the course. So as always, uh, everything will be recorded and posted on Canvas after. So if at any point you feel like you have to leave, uh, feel free and everything will be posted after. Um, you just might not get the benefit of having questions live. So uh, that's the only real downside to not being here and watching things later. But as always, um, you can post things on the Canvas discussion board or email me and I will be able to uh, get to you when you have those questions. So uh, everything that we covered on Friday was just some background information for the course and for you. So uh, this is where the real content starts and this is where your assignment questions and tests will start to come from. So for some of you, if you took Ling220 with Meg Grant, uh, you will recognize some of this content. If you took it with Heather Bliss, I'm not sure if you'll recognize this. If you took it with Dean Mello, all of this stuff will absolutely be new to you because he does not cover this stuff. Um, so let's just take a look at what we'll be doing today. Um, okay, my pen has died. Let me just get my other one. Okay, so we'll start with synonymy and contradiction. Uh, we're not talking about the word level here. We're talking about the sentence level. So you may be familiar with synonymy at the sentence level. Uh, with the term paraphrase, uh, they can be used interchangeably. We'll talk about terms like entailments, implicatures, and presuppositions. Uh, entailment and presupposition belong to the domain of semantics, but implicatures is something that belongs to uh, pragmatics. So we will be talking a little bit about pragmatics here, and that's because implicature is something that you need real world knowledge for. And then ambiguity, of course, uh, things like when a word has two meanings or when there's two structures to a sentence or when we have this everybody loves somebody situation. Uh, these are things that we'll talk about with ambiguity. So uh, let's jump into synonymy or paraphrase and contradiction. So these are things that uh, you might have learned in even as early as elementary school but we'll talk about these linguistically. And uh, there, there's a lot of words and stuff here on this page. Don't worry too much about the words. We'll just talk about these things generally and you can refer to the text if you need some more detail. But uh, a lot of these concepts can be explained in, in, in very simple terms. So uh, with, with synonymy and contradiction and entailment, uh, let's, let's just start simple and think, uh, don't think too much about words. Think about information, think about content. So we'll say that two sentences are synonymous and we'll use placeholders like A and B. So whenever we see capital A or capital B here, we're just using these as sentence placeholders. So we'll say sentence A is synonymous with sentence B. If the in information or the content is exactly the same. So in one, uh, customers bought clothing at Walmart compared to B, clothing was bought at Walmart by customers. The info in these sentences is the same. So we can say that these sentences are synonymous with each other or they're paraphrases of each other. And uh, in syntax, we would say that these are an active version and passive version of the same sentence. So uh, customers bought clothing at Walmart. Uh, here we have the subject of the sentence customers who are buying the clothing. And in the second sentence, we have the passive version where um, the original subject, customers who are the ones purchasing the clothing have been put in this buy phrase. So it's become optional. Uh, and the original object is now the thing being focused. Uh, but all the information is still being presented in the sentence, it's just being reordered. But the content is exactly the same. So we say they're paraphrases. Now, when it comes to sentences and complete synonymy, uh, this is actually very rare. Uh, even though these sentences do convey the same information, it's really not 
completely synonymous because the focus of the sentences is different. Uh, in the active version, we're focusing on the customers. We're saying it's the customers who bought the clothing. In the second sentence, we're saying, oh, we're focusing on the clothing. It's the clothing that was bought. We're not really focusing on the fact that the customers bought it. So uh, there's a different tone, there's different attitudes, uh, there's different context that we use the sentence in. So although the content is a paraphrase, and that's really our definition, we're saying that uh, sentence A is synonymous with B because the content is the same. Uh, there are different tones and different attitudes and uh, different presuppositions, which we'll cover later, that do make the, the context we use these sentences in slightly different. So uh, the term complete synonymy isn't something that we'll talk about really at all in this course other than in this line. Um, but uh, that is something to be aware of, is that you know we have specific constructions that we use in specific situations. Um, so, you know, that's why we have paraphrases, right? We, uh, we, we always say like in academic writing, you should always write in the active voice instead of the passive voice. That's a specific context that we use active writing in academic writing. Uh, we don't use passive writing because that's a context where you use active writing. Uh, so if we take a look at two, which is another good contrast, uh, this is the same information in two. It was Sal who wrote a book compared to it was a book that Sal wrote. Yeah, these are still paraphrases. They still have the same content, uh, but the focus is very different. So it was Sal who wrote a book. Well, you could ask a question here. You could say, uh, who wrote a book? And you could say, oh, it was Sal who wrote a book. That could be the answer to that question. But in the second one, 2B, it was a book that Sal wrote. You could say, uh, what did Sal write? That could be your question. And then your response would be, it was a book that Sal wrote. Uh, these two sentences are responses to different questions. So these are still paraphrases. Uh, they're still synonymous sentences with each other, but they're responses to different questions. So they're used in different contexts. Uh, this, this last example here is just a little funny thing. So. Uh, I accidentally butt dialed my manager compared to I accidentally booty called my manager. I mean, we can't just take uh, two similar words, uh, two, two synonyms in different contexts and replace them and expect to get the same meaning. Uh, language isn't super logical like that. Um, but yeah, uh, synonyms and paraphrases, uh, they're very frequent in language. Um, but total synonymy isn't going to happen often. We have to be aware of our context. We have to be aware of the speaker's tones and we have to be aware of uh, what they're being used for. So the uh, last question, is: they're not the same sentences? No, uh, 3A and 3B are very different. Uh, but, tiled, <laughs> but dialed my manager uh, would be an accidental phone call uh, and booty called my manager. Uh, this would be uh, an invitation for something that is 18 plus. And I would, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, quite, quite, quite different. <laughs> but, but uh, in context, bud and booty are synonymous and dialed and called are synonymous. But when you put them together, they come out a little bit differently. So that's, that's synonymy. Uh, another term for this, again, is, is paraphrase. Uh, typically, synonymy is used with individual words and paraphrase is used with an entire sentence, but you can use them interchangeably. Uh, the next one is contradiction. So this is important to understand for what's coming up with entailment. So if there's anything confusing about this, please uh, bother me at any time here. So we say that a sentence is contradictory if it can never be true. And this is where we're first going to see this little uh, pound symbol, or I guess it's, it's a hashtag now. It doesn't matter what you want to call it. Uh, so here's the sentence. Uh, my sister is jealous of me because I'm an only child. So we have a contradictory element here. So sister means that you have a sibling and only child means that you have no siblings. So in this sentence, what you're saying here is that you have one sibling and at the same time, you're saying you have no sibling. 
Now, this doesn't make sense because you can't have one sibling and no sibling at the same time. Therefore, this is contradictory. It can never be true. So uh, much like the asterisk means uh, a bad syntactic violation, or just I'll call it bad syntax, uh, the pound sign or the hashtag means uh, bad semantics. So usually this means it's semantically weird or there's a semantic violation, so a contradiction. So you can think of this little pound sign as there being a contradiction. So my sister is jealous of me because I'm an only child. This is contradictory. This is semantically bad. So this is within one sentence, but we can have a pair of contradictory sentences as well. So in 5a and b, uh, both of these cannot be true at the same time. So Karen is married and Karen is single. If we take these one by one, they're fine. You can have a situation where Karen is married. You can have a situation where Karen is single, but you cannot have a situation where Karen is married and Karen is single at the same time. If you put both of them together, it's contradictory. So usually to do this, you would just say, okay, let's put one together and then say Karen is married and single. So you can create a new sentence with both of them. And then very clearly uh, that is not okay. Now, uh, it's, it's common to speak in contradictions. Uh, in fact, 6A is something that you hear I wouldn't say often, but it's something that you can hear as an insult. Uh, so Azad is smart and he isn't smart. Now this is used usually to, to mean something. So uh, usually Azad is smart and he isn't smart can mean uh, he's book smart, but not street smart, or he's street smart and not book smart. So he's smart in some respects, but not in other respects. So it's, it's common to speak in contradictions. Uh, this, is, this is the element of pragmatics here. Uh, if we talk in literal meaning in semantics, of course it's bad, but with real world knowledge, we know what someone's usually trying to say. There is a context involved here. So although 6a semantically is not okay, we can still understand it and get meaning out of it. So whenever we talk about uh, this word discourse effects or discourse, uh, usually this means that we're involving some sort of pragmatics, some sort of real world knowledge. So is this concept of contradiction clear for people? Thumbs up, thumbs up, that's good, that's good. Yes, yes, that's good. Yeah, these, these are very quick slides for things like contradiction and synonymy, but they're very core concepts. So if contradiction isn't clear, it's gonna make entailments a little bit confusing when we talk about it. Okay. Uh, yeah, so these, these are very quick, but um, yeah, if, if, if this becomes confusing at any point, again, just interrupt me and we can talk about that. So these are our two quick properties. Uh, and now we're gonna jump into some of the more uh, difficult things. And what I want to mention about entailment and uh, implicature and presupposition is that, uh, I mean, this is the first semantics lecture, but usually people do struggle with this. So if you are having difficulties at first, um, you know, don't, don't feel bad. Uh, this is a very common point of struggling in the first week. Um, that's why we do it early. So we have time to work on it and you have time to ask questions. So, um, yeah, we'll, we'll start with actually the most challenging one first. So entailment is about logical consequence. And I really want you to think not about words right now, but about information. So this is about a connection between two sentences, between two ideas. So let's say you have some sentence A and some sentence B. In fact, I want to talk about sentence seven first before really talking about the definition. So say I have the sentence, Ken is a brown and white dog. And I can ask myself, just based on this one fact, Ken is a brown and white dog, what do I know is true? Well, there's a couple things I know for sure. If Ken is a brown and white dog, I know for sure that Ken is a dog because I've established that Ken is a brown and white dog, so Ken is a dog, that's something that's true. 
Uh, if Ken is a brown and white dog, I know that Ken is some dog's name because I've established that Ken is a brown and white dog, so Ken is some dog's name. Uh, I also know that if Ken is a brown and white dog, that Ken is brown and white. Because if Ken is a brown and white dog, then Ken is brown and white. Uh, but what I don't know if Ken is a brown and white dog is I don't know for sure that Ken likes bacon. Uh, I don't know for sure that Ken has four legs. I don't know for sure that uh, Ken has fur. So entailment is about what you know for sure based on a sentence. So for example, with the seven sentence, I know for sure that 7A entails 7B. And we use this little symbol it's a turnstile with two little spokes uh, to mean entailment. So 7A guarantees the truth of 7B. So this says, if 7A is true, then 7B must be true as well. Uh, I know that 7A, Ken is a brown and white dog, entails 7C, that Ken is some dog's name. So 7C as well. But I don't know for sure if Ken is a brown and white dog, that Ken likes big, bacon. So I say that 7a does not entail 7d. And we use a little turnstile and we put a little line through it to say that it does not entail. And when we say does not entail, what this means is that it does not guarantee the truth. So um, does not guarantee the truth. So it still could be true that Ken likes bacon, but we don't know for sure 100% of the time, just based off 7a, that that is a fact. Okay. So maybe not the most straightforward concept, but let's go back to the definition now. So just based off that one example, and then we'll do another one after. Uh, if a entails b, so if a sentence a entails sentence b, whenever that first sentence a is true, B must be true. So another way of thinking about this in terms of information is that if a sentence A entails a sentence B, then what is said in sentence B must already be conveyed in sentence A. So thinking about it backwards, using that Ken is a brown and white dog example, let's take a look at 7B. Ken is a dog. Okay. If Ken is a brown and white dog entails that Ken is a dog. The fact that Ken is a dog must already be present in 7a. So this information in 7b has to be in 7a somewhere. So the fact that Ken is a dog is already present in the fact that Ken is a brown and white dog. And we do see that it's in there. So there's two ways of thinking about it there. I don't know which one is gonna be easier for you. It depends what your style of thinking is. Um, so you can think about it sort of backwards in that information containment way, or you can think about it in, okay, I have this first sentence, what logically must be true based on the second one. Okay, um, now if your intuition isn't fantastic about this, don't worry, we're gonna find an actual test that we can do. Uh, to check to see whether this is a, a true thing or not, like an actual scientific test that works. Um, but let's do one more example without the test to see uh, if we can get any more intuition first. So let me take this and just make this a little bit smaller for now. Okay. So I'm sure you all remember the uh, hit song, Pineapple Apple Pen, a few years ago. Well, here's an example based off that. Uh, Pico Taro has a pen and an apple. So here's 8A. Here's what we're starting with. And let's ask ourselves, uh, what must be true based off 8A? So if Pico Taro has a pen and an apple, then we know for sure that Pico Taro has a pen because he has a pen and an apple. So he must have a, he must has a pen. He must has a pen, yeah, that's grammatical. Okay, uh, if Pico Taro has a pen and an apple, then Pico Taro has an apple. So 8A entails 8B, 8A entails 
8C. Uh, but if Pico Taro has a pen and an apple, is it 100% guaranteed that Pico Taro has a pineapple pen? Well, we're not 100% certain based off 8A, so we cannot say for sure that 8A entails 8D, so it does not entail 8D. Uh, so in philosophy with entailment, if both are false and the whole statement is true, does this apply to linguistics? Uh, the answer to that is yes, but we will not be considering those cases because those are not interesting to us as linguists. So to everyone else who read the question, uh, don't worry too much about that one. So um, what I'll say about this example with 8a, uh, this is sort of a nice example of a conjunction. Um, so I have a noun phrase. So I have like an NP1 and an NP2. Well, if I have one noun phrase and a second noun phrase, then yeah, I have the first noun phrase on its own and I have the second noun phrase on its own. So you can sort of break the conjunction down. If I have two noun phrases individually, or sorry, if I have two noun phrases together, then I have each noun phrase individually. That's kind of a nice one. Okay, uh, so these in some ways is kind of, uh, I, I, I use the word intuitive here, but um, intuitive doesn't really necessarily mean that uh, it's intuitive to everyone. This just means that after a lot of practice, it eventually becomes uh, quick. Uh, it doesn't mean that it's really obvious. So we have some tests that we can use to determine whether something entails something else. So let's talk about that test. Uh, and it's called the contradiction test. So that's why we need to know how to use contradictions. And the logic of this uh, can be a little bit challenging. So here's the idea. If A entails B, this means that if A is true, B must be true. So this, this is just what entailment means. So if A entails B, then if A is true, B must be true. So we ask ourselves a simple question. What if A is true and B is false? So what if we said, okay, A entails B and we make A true, but then we make B false? Then clearly something bad should happen in this case. Because if A is true, B must be true but we're saying, okay, we're gonna make B false. Well, something horrible should happen in this case, and we're gonna see what happens in this case. So I've already demonstrated the test here. So let's just investigate what happens. Okay, so here's what I'm doing. I'm saying uh, for 1A, Ken is a brown and white dog. Entails that Ken is brown and white. So I'm already giving like, uh, an entailment relationship and I'm showing you, okay, this is true. So 1A entails 1B in this case. Ken is a brown and white dog entails that Ken is brown and white. So A entails B. Now, here's what happens if we take A and we take not B. So what we're doing here is we're saying, Let's make B false. We're gonna keep A true, but we're going to make B false. So here's our result. And we'll go through what this means again afterwards. We get Ken is a brown and white dog, but Ken is not brown and white. Ken is a brown and white dog, but Ken is not brown and white. So we get this contradiction. We get this little line that says Ken is brown and white, but Ken is not brown and white. So what's happened here is we've taken A entails B, we've taken our B sentence, we've said, okay, let's make B false. And then what's happened is we've ended up with a contradiction when we put them together. So if we have an entailment relationship, 
we have sentence A entails sentence B, and we make B false, we end up with this contradiction. So this is one way we can test to make sure that we have an entailment relationship. So here's another example. Pigotaro has a pen and an apple. Here's our sentence A. And I'm gonna tell you that Pigotaro has a pen. This is sentence B. Pikotaro has a pen and an apple entails that Pikotaro has a pen. Okay, so I'll walk through this one a little bit more carefully. So uh, what I want to do is, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm claiming here that A entails B. So I want to check for sure to make sure that this is the case. So what I'm going to do is I want to use a contradiction test. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take B and I'm going to negate it. So I'm going to make this a not B statement. So what I'll do is I'll take this sentence B and I'm going to negate the sentence. So I'm going to say Picotaro does not have a pen. So I'll take B and I'll make it the negated version. And then I'm going to put them together into a sentence. So that is what this line is. So this is now A and not B, and if if there is an entailment, so I'll, I'll write this out, I'll type this out. If A entails B, then A and not B will be a contradiction. So let's uh, see what this says. Let me just break this up a little bit so we can see that. Uh, Pico Taro has a pen and an apple, but Pico Taro does not have a pen. Okay, so we see has a pen, does not have a pen. And that gives us a contradiction. So because we have a contradiction here, we know for sure that yes, this is an entailment. Okay, I can guarantee there are some people confused after all this. So uh, are there any questions about this process? <laughs> so far, so good. Um, just out of curiosity, um, yeah. Is there a way to manipulate A and then uh, come up with a contradiction, not manipulate with B? Um, we have to manipulate B in this case. Uh, if you want to manipulate A, you also have to manipulate B at the same time. Uh, these are just the rules of logic, which we'll cover in a few weeks. So... I can't answer your question for a few more weeks, unfortunately. Otherwise, we'd have to take a 10 to 15 minute detour. Okay, thank you. Yes, sorry about that. Okay, uh, what I can show you in case there's anyone who's a little bit confused about how this works is I can show you an example of doing this test where we don't get a contradiction. Uh, so here are two examples where the first sentence does not entail the second, and here's what happens when we negate B. So, um, so far we've just seen examples of entailment. So uh, here's 9A and 9B. Uh, Kim is right or wrong. So Kim is right or wrong does not entail that Kim is wrong, because Kim could be right. We don't know. So 9A does not entail 9B. So here is sentence A, here is sentence B. So if we wanna do this contradiction test, what we have to do is we have to take B, we have to put a not in front of it. So we have to say, okay, Kim is not wrong. And then we have to put this together uh, to make A and not B. So contradiction test gives us Kim is right or wrong, that's A, but this is and, uh, Kim is not wrong, so this is not B. So A and not B. Now what do we get? Uh, Kim is right or wrong, but Kim is not wrong. 
well, this is not a contradictory sentence anymore. Uh, Kim is right or wrong, but Kim is not wrong. Uh, this is a fine sentence. Uh, this just means that Kim is right. So when we do this contradiction test on a pair of sentences where there's no entailment, we do not get a contradiction. We get a sentence that is perfectly fine. So because this makes sense, uh, we know there is no entailment. So A does not entail B in this case. Now, I should still say here, we don't know if B entails A. We, we, we don't know about the opposite direction, but we do know for sure that A does not entail B. Uh, would that sentence entail that Kim might be wrong? Uh, Kim is right or wrong, Kim might be wrong. Uh, see, the thing with the, the word might is a modal, and when it comes to modal operators, um, Modals get quite tricky with entailment. Uh, modals are usually always entailed, words like might or may. So we won't deal with those. Um, I believe that P always entails might P. So usually yes. Uh, here's another example with some dog and every dog. So if we say some dog is brown, that does not entail that every dog is brown because some dog may be white, some dog may be blonde, black, and so on. So uh, here is sentence A, here is sentence B. If we wanna do the contradiction test, we have to make not B. So we could do every dog is not brown. Then to do the contradiction test, we do A and not B. So we take some dog is brown, we use and, in this case, I've been using but, um, and and but mean the same thing. Uh, but is just contrasting and, but they mean the same thing. Uh, just pick whichever one sounds better. Um, but uh, not every dog is brown or every dog is not brown. These can mean the same thing. Uh, so not B, uh, A and not B. So how does this sound? Uh, some dog is brown, but not every dog is brown. Sorry. I'm, I'm gonna put the knot up front just to be consistent here. Uh, some dog is brown, but not every dog is brown. Okay, yeah, this is fine. This doesn't sound bad. So we know in this case that A does not entail B. Some dog is brown, but not every dog is brown. So uh, if we don't get a contradiction in our test, we know there's no entailment. So you can kind of see the contrast between the two examples that we had. Uh, on this page and on the previous page. So the direction does matter. If you have A entails B, when you negate B, you can only do this in one direction. So if you want to check the other direction, you have to flip the sentences around and you have to do the test again, negating the other sentence. So for example, if we wanted to check if B entails A, we would have to, uh, we want to do B entails A, we would have to negate A instead, and then put B first, do B and not A, and then check that direction. So uh, this does not work both ways with one test. You have to do one test for each direction. Uh, that's sort of the only downside of this test, but this is sort of just how the logic works, and there's no real way around that. Uh, so that is how entailment works. Are there any questions about entailment? Okay, so to quickly summarize then, entailment is about logical consequence. What must be true based on given information in a sentence? That's important. So if you have one line to remember about entailment, it's what must be true based on information given in a sentence. What must be true? And that contrasts with implicature. 
Implicature is pragmatic. Uh, let me just make me a little bit smaller. There we go. Camera's a little bit smaller. I lost like a pound there. That's great. Okay. Implicature is about what you expect someone to mean. It's about what might possibly be true. So entailment is about what must be true. Implicature is what might possibly mean true based on your expectations. So implicatures arise because of what uh, you know about a person, about what you know about the real world, what you know about language. Um, it's a lot of things that come into play. So entailment uses uh, this little turnstile and implicature uses this little uh, plus arrow notation. So 11, here's an example. Carla used to ride the 145 every day. Now we can take a look at this word used to. And when we hear used to, we expect that she no longer does ride the 145 every day. So Carla used to ride the 145 every day. We expect that she no longer rides the 145 every day. But it could be that she still does. We don't know. Or if you hear something like, John is taking four classes. We expect that John is taking exactly four classes, but he could be taking more. Uh, it could be that he's filling out some scholarship application where the question is, are you taking four classes? And he says, yes, I'm taking four classes. But really, he's taking five or six. But the scholarship is just asking, are you taking four classes? Because that's all they need is a minimum. And he's saying yes. So usually, whenever we ask for numbers, we're implying that the number is exact. But that's never a guarantee. In order to guarantee an exact number, we have to specify it's exactly four. Uh, if you ask me how many pets I have and I say I have two pets, I'm implying that I have exactly two pets, but I could be hiding one from you. Uh, it would be weird for me to do that, but it's an implication. Okay, so let's take a look at uh, some tests for this uh, just to really see how this works. Um, so with implicatures, you can, uh, you can do two things with, re with implicatures. You can do what's called reinforcing the implicature, meaning uh, confirming your expectations. Let me just write this down because I, I like these words more than the official tests. Uh, confirming your expectations. So reinforcing your expectations. So Carla used to ride the 145 every day implies that she no longer rides the 145 every day. So you can explicitly state this. You can confirm it and say, Carla used to ride the 145 every day, but she no longer does. Okay, that confirms your expectations. But you can also cancel them. So you can, uh, you can deny your expectations as well. And both of these are okay. With implicatures, you can do both of these. And it's not weird. So Carla used to ride the 145 every day. Still implies that Carla no longer rides the 145 every day. It still implies that. But you can deny that expectation. So you can say, Carla used to ride the 145 every day. And she still does. You're denying that expectation. It's not, it, it might not be what you expect. But this is not contradictory. It's not that weird. And uh, one thing I want to point out here, if, if we take a look at this structure compared to the entailment structure, and I think this is really important, um, if we take a look at the A and B, this, these pairs of sentences, the reinforcement test is like doing A and B. The cancellation test or denying your expectations is like doing A and not B. And what we see with both of these is that both of these are okay. 
Now, when you think about an entailment relationship, if there is entailment, A and not B is never okay. A and not B is a contradiction. Uh, if we think about entailment too, uh, if you do entailment with A and B, you're going to notice it sounds a little weird. Uh, so yeah, I mean, you you can try that on your own with one of the with one of the examples with A and B, and and you'll find it's a little odd. Uh, we have some practice exercises I can demonstrate that for you as well um, when we do that. Um, but know. with sorry, yes, go ahead. Sorry. Um. So for this cancellation test, if you say Carla used to write the one forty five every day, does that mean that it can imply that sentence can imply and she still does? Uh. So it implies that she no longer rides the 145 every day. That's the implication. That's what you expect it to mean. But the reality is that she still can. So, so this is like, uh, this is just like um, one reality. So it doesn't mean that when you say Carla used to ride the 145 every day, it does not imply that she still does. No, it does not imply that she still does. It implies that she no longer does, but the reality can be that she still does. Okay. It's like um, uh, it's it, it's like when you say, uh, I don't know, I used to smoke a pack of cigarettes every day, but I still do. You know, like it's, you, you can use it in a, in a joking sense. Um, or as a way to like talk about a previous accomplishment where like I quit for a bit, but now I'm doing it again. The expectation is that you stop, but you still do. Uh, I do have some more examples in the practice after. Um, sorry, what's, what's my next slide here? Okay. Um, it could mean she rides the 145 every week. I mean, that would be a different example too. So I used to ride the 145 every week. I no longer ride the 145 every week. Uh, we still want to keep everything mostly similar. Uh, the thing with implicatures though is, is it's more like uh, words like used to, um, uh, it's, Words like used to, words like still. Um, we'll, we'll see some examples in a bit. I, I really need some fleshed out sentences for these. So I think what's good is to try this example here. So here's a question we can try. So John is taking four classes implies that uh, John is taking four, oh, sorry, exactly four classes and no more. So what I'd like you to try to do in uh, five minutes or so, or I guess in a few minutes is just try to reinforce and cancel this one. So, uh, you know, do the A and B and A and not B and see if you can show that this is an implicature uh, using the reinforcement and cancellation test. Uh, you're free to ask any questions that you have while you do this, uh, either through the chat or through voice. Um, but just try to do the test on your own. And if you have any questions about how implicature works, again, uh, feel free to do that as well. Um, this, this is sort of a weird example, again, too, because uh, you really need a specific context where this works. So think about the scholarship situation where he's just filling out a form that says you need four courses in order to apply for the scholarship. But John may be taking more than four courses to fill it out. So uh, try this example on your own and we'll go through the solutions and just sort of talk about this afterwards. So I'll give you a few minutes and then we'll talk about this.
Okay. Um, does anyone have any sentences that came up for the reinforcement? I sort of I sort of gave two little templates here for how I start these, but John is taking four classes and no more. Yeah, that's that's a very straightforward one for uh, A. John is taking four classes, which is all he had time for. John is taking four classes, but he would like to take more. Okay, so uh, this is good that I asked. Um, so okay, let's talk about this. Um, usually when we do this, we want to stick to the sentences that we're given. So uh, we want to show that John is taking four classes A implies that John is taking four classes and no more, which is B. So uh, we want to construct our sentences using just A and B. So some variation of these. So when we did... Uh, Carla used to ride the 145 every day and she still does. Uh, really what we did here was we negated Carla no longer rides the 145 every day and I just abbreviated it. So I could have said Carla still rides the 145 every day, but I said and she still does as an abbreviation. So uh, I really like um, what Harmon has said up there. John is taking four classes and no more. Uh, Yolanda um really good for the cancellation too john is taking four classes actually he is taking more classes uh deborah good as well so um so john is taking four classes here's how i usually set this up uh, john is taking four classes uh in fact he is taking uh exactly four classes so um this is very straightforward in the fact that i have a uh for in fact this is just another variation of and and then I have B. So reinforcement is just A and B. And then cancellation, all I'm doing is doing A and not B. So here's A, actually is another version of and, and then I want to do not B. So I need to do uh, some version of uh, uh, John is taking exactly four classes. So John is not taking exactly four classes. So I could do uh, what Yolanda did. He is, actually he is, taking uh, more than four classes. Can you say possibly more courses? Yeah, he is taking more courses. That would be fine too. Uh, well, I should use classes here. That would be fine, just, just to be consistent. If you said taking four courses, he is taking more courses, that's fine too. Would yeah. you be able to specify the number of courses that he's taking? Sure. Yeah, why not? You could say he's taking five courses or six courses. That's fine. As long as it's uh, more, more or less than four. Yeah, you're just trying to show in this case that, um, that it could be reinforced and canceled. So do we need to try both tests to prove that A implies B or is it proved if one of the tests passes? Uh, for implications, you wanna show that it can be reinforced and canceled uh, because that's the special property of uh, implicatures is that it can be reinforced and canceled. Um, with entailment, really, you just need to show that it could be contradicted. Um, but with re, uh, but with implicatures, that's the that's the special property that you can do A and B and A and not B, and both of them are okay. So, yeah, in this case with the numbers, um, no, John's taking four classes, and our expectation is met. He's taking exactly four. Uh, John is taking four classes, but actually our expectations have been denied. He's taking more than four classes. Uh, both of these are fine. So even though the cancellation doesn't mean that, doesn't mean that there's implication, the cancellation is still a part of the implication? Yeah, the cancellation just shows that our, that our implication is an implication. Like uh, our implication is that he's taking exactly four classes but the cancellation shows that our implication can be denied, that our implication is just our expectation, that our implication is not a guaranteed truth. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so we'll take a 10 minute break here and then we will come back and do presuppositions. So if you have any questions, you can type them in chat or keep them in your head and I can uh, answer them when we get back.
Okay, uh, were there any questions about entailment and obligature before we move on? Okay, uh, let's talk about presuppositions, which is another semantic property. Uh, this is about information that a speaker takes for granted. So this isn't 100% about the language. Uh, well, it is about the language, but it's about the speaker. So when someone talks, they make assumptions about uh, you know, the language or people. Uh, so this is about what a speaker takes for granted as background knowledge. And this uses another symbol that you'll find in text. So a double arrow that is very close to each other. And let's just talk about some examples. There are many different types of presuppositions. Uh, we do not classify them as different types in this course. We just call all of them presuppositions. Uh, there are some listed on the Canvas page as well, so I'd recommend taking a look at the different uh, examples on the Canvas lecture page. Um, but there are some here, and we'll talk about the different tests for those as well. So 13, uh, the Queen of England lives in Buckingham Palace. So words like the, this, these, those, that, uh, these presuppose existence. If I say the Queen of England, I'm assuming that that thing exists. So the Queen of England, I'm presupposing the existence of a Queen of England. If I say I went up to SFU and I took a picture next to the statue of the unicorn, uh, I'm assuming that there's a statue of a unicorn. And there's a great test for this. It's called the hey hold up test also known as the hey wait a minute test uh if if i say i took a pack a picture next to the statue of the unicorn at sfu you would stop me and you would say hey wait a minute there is no statue of a unicorn at sfu you would deny my presupposition um so uh, presuppositions can be denied with a hey, wait a minute test. So uh, these existence presuppositions are great for that. So words like the, this, these, that. Uh, here, here's another type of presupposition. Uh, this goes along with the example of, um, you know, uh, beating or uh, I guess I saw this example last week with the, do you regret beating up your dog or something like that? Uh, Stephen regrets suing his old boss. When you say regret, you have to have done an action in order to regret doing that action. So when you say Stephen regrets suing his old boss, you presuppose that Stephen in fact did sue his old boss in the past. So when you regret something, you presuppose that this action afterwards has been done. So if I say Stephen regrets X, then I've presupposed that X has been done. So in this case, Stephen sued his old boss, has been presupposed here. Uh, in 15, we see something called a cleft construction. Uh, cleft constructions are something you would see in a syntax course uh, when you talk about constituency tests or in a graduate syntax course when you talk about sentence structures. Uh, it's not something we take a look in detail here, but it's good to talk about presuppositions. So a cleft construction is when you say, it was blank who, or it was blank that, and then did something. So what happens here, 
is you take a noun phrase, it was Colonel Sanders who bought New York's premier ticket chicken shop. And this focuses someone. This says it was this particular person or this particular thing who did the action. And this presupposes that someone did in fact do an action. So if I say it was Colonel Sanders who bought New York's premier chicken shop, I'm presupposing that someone out there did buy it. So I presupposed that someone bought New York's premier chicken shop. Uh, here's another example. Uh, if I say uh, it was uh, Derek who fell into the lava, I'm presupposing that someone fell into the lava. It would be weird if I said it was Derek who fell into the lava if no one fell into the lava. Why would I say that then? So these are just three examples of presuppositions. I'm basically just using a construction or using a particular word to say that um, there's other information that I'm just taking for granted as background knowledge. It's not really the main content I'm trying to get across. Uh, it's just background information. Like when I say Stephen regrets suing his old boss, the main content I'm trying to get across is not the fact that Stephen sued his old boss. The main content I'm trying to get across is that Stephen regrets it. It's just background information that Stephen sued his old boss. But you would say, wait, hold on a second. If that's not true, hold on a second. Stephen never sued his old boss. In 15, it was Colonel Sanders who bought New York's premier chicken shop. Wait, hold on a second. No one bought New York's premier chicken shop. Like that's how you would use that, hey, wait a, minute, wait a minute test, if that never happened. So uh, let's actually see the different tests we can use for this. And then I'll use two more examples. So that way we can actually see each of these tests in action and we can see more examples of presuppositions. Uh, uh, could you also say, Stephen never had a boss. Uh, Stephen sued his old boss. Stephen regrets suing his old boss. Uh, could you say Stephen never had a boss for this example? Um, you could say that Stephen never had a boss. That could also work. Um, I was thinking if that was relevant to this particular example for suing his old boss, and I think it would still work. Yeah. I mean, even though the, the focus was on the fact that Stephen sued his old boss, you could still say, hold on a second. No, Stephen never had a boss. How could he sue his old boss if he never had one? It would still deny it just fine. Yeah, that would be totally fine in this case. Yeah, you can be a lot looser with these than with implicatures because all you would have to do is deny something in that content, and especially because of the word his, right? His is a lot like the word the. Uh, when you use the word his, you're presupposing the existence of an old boss. So there's sort of another presupposition hidden in there with the word his. Okay, so three types of tests for presuppositions. Uh, this is a lot like implicature in a way, uh, the types of tests, but remember presupposition is about uh, the speaker, what the speaker is taking uh, for granted. So uh, these work a little bit different too, because these, are, these happen in conversations. So the accommodation test basically just means you accept the, con the information uh, as true. And in a conversation, you generally don't say anything. There are many presuppositions in conversations. Basically, every time you hear a possessive pronoun, like, uh, sorry, a possessive determiner, like his or her or my or their, there's a presupposition. Every time you hear the or knows or regrets, uh, that there's a presupposition. And you don't say something when you hear those. You just be quiet and let them finish. So when you accommodate presuppositions, you just stay silent. Uh, so the accommodation test is more like you don't interrupt them. You just let it go. Uh, the failure test is when you interrupt them and say, hold on a second, that this is your, uh, this is your, hey, wait a minute test. Uh, it's it's got to be in all caps. It doesn't have to be, but when I type it, it has to be because I never get to use all caps in an academic setting in case of, uh, except for presuppositions. Uh, the attitude test is really 
the most interesting one. Um, because with an attitude test, you get to manipulate the sentence. And as you manipulate the sentence, the presupposition doesn't go away, which is incredible. Because with implicature and entailment, if you manipulate the sentence, if you negate it, if you turn it into a question, if you turn it into an if-then sentence, if you turn it into a maybe sentence, uh, the entailment and implicature disappears. But with presuppositions, if you turn it into a negation, if you make it into a question, if you make it into an if-then sentence, the presupposition still stays. And the attitude test because of that is very powerful. So we can see this in action. So we'll go through two examples here where we can see, see each of these. Okay, so at the top, uh, this is the presupposition that we'll take a look at. So the sentence is, Charlie knows that unicorns are real. Now, unicorns are not real, in case anyone was not aware. Uh, 16b, the presupposition that we have here is that unicorns are real. I know it's, it's shocking. I know it's shocking. I'm sorry. I'm sorry you had to learn that here. Uh, the presupposition is unicorns are real. So let's take a look at each of these tests. We can accommodate it, we can fail it, and we can see the attitude. So, uh, some so usually what we call these words, so I have these words in blue here, and we usually call these um, uh, presupposition triggers. So these are usually the words or phrases that cause the presupposition to occur. So the word knows is a presupposition trigger, which means that everything afterwards is taken as background knowledge. So usually in a conversation, if we accommodate it, we would just not say anything, but we could be a smart ass and we could say, oh, it's good he finally figured that out. So that's just accommodating it. We acknowledge it as truth. So we could be silent too, that's fine. So, or silence. Now, uh, our failure test, here's our, hey, wait a minute. If we hear this in a conversation, Charlie knows that unicorns are real and we want to fail it, we'd say, hey, wait a minute, or but wait a minute, unicorns aren't real. And this is when we fail it. This is where we interrupt and we say, hold on a second, Charlie, unicorns aren't real. What are you talking about? This, your background information here is wrong. You need to stop that. Okay. Uh, not that interesting of a test, but that's where we interrupt and we say, fix your attitude. Now, here's, here's where the linguistically interesting stuff happens. Okay, so here's the attitude test. Uh, first, we start with our declarative sentence. So here's our original sentence. And when we do the attitude test, uh, we do it on the A sentence. So we start with A. We're not doing it on the, uh, the thing that's presupposed. We do it on the A sentence, Charlie knows that unicorns are real. So B, uh, the first thing we can do is we negate it. So we can say, Charlie doesn't know that unicorns are real. So we can call this the, the negated sentence. So we can say this is not A. And when we read this, we can still see that unicorns are real is presupposed. Charlie doesn't know that unicorns are real. There's still an assumption here that unicorns are real, but Charlie just doesn't know it yet. Charlie doesn't know that unicorns are real. When are we going to tell him? So this is sort of an interesting case because if this were an entailment or implicature, uh, we wouldn't still have this here. The entailment would be gone. The implicature uh, would probably be gone too, or it would change. Uh, but with presupposition, we still get this fact that unicorns are real is still background information. Um, so we negated it and it's still there. Uh, we can turn it into a question. Uh, we can ask ourselves, A, uh, does Charlie know that unicorns are real? And we still get that same thing. Does Charlie know that unicorns are real? it still presupposes that unicorns are real. Is Charlie aware that unicorns are real yet? Does he know that yet? Okay. 
It's still there if it's a question, which is amazing. Uh, what about D? What if we turn it into an if then sentence? Like a, this is called a, a conditional. So a conditional says that uh, if you do something, then something else happens. Sometimes the then is cut out. So in this sentence, the then is just gone. Uh, so if Charlie knew unicorns were real, he'd buy one. So if, so if A, then whatever. And in this case, it's still the same thing. You still presuppose that unicorns are real. So if Charlie knew unicorns were real, I'm still assuming unicorns are real. If Charlie knew that, he'd do something else. Okay, so all of these different sentences, if I make it a neg uh, negation, if I make it a question, if I make it a conditional, I still presuppose that unicorns are real. So that's, that, that's a great test for presuppositions. No other type of inference will do this. Entailment won't, implicature won't. If you can get this to work, uh, it's a presupposition for sure. So are there any questions about this before I show you the second example? Um, so I'm, I'm wondering if the conditional always implies that unicorns are real. Cause, cause like, if Charlie knew that unicorns were real, he would buy one. I, I think I could still say that, um, even if it's impossible to know that unicorns are real because unicorns aren't real. It's like, if you could know that unicorns were real, then unicorns would be real, but he doesn't know that because they're not real. Mm. Yeah, so I mean, it's still possible for them not to be real. Like, so, so yeah, presuppositions can still be false. No, I know, but but like, if if Charlie knew that unicorns were real, I'm I'm not sure that that presupposes that unicorns were real, or or if it presupposes that it's possible to know that they're real. Mm, okay, 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 yeah, yeah, I I, I see where that is. Um, yeah, conditionals can do that. Um, there is a lot of literature on conditionals. Uh, so I don't know if I really want to get too deep into that. Um, hmm. So I don't, do I want to take the easy way out right now? I think I might want to take the easy way out at this point in the course uh, and just say that you do not have to do the conditional test if this doesn't work at this point in time, uh, just because there are some things like that with the conditional that don't, that aren't necessarily convincing. Um, some people use the maybe test as well, or the perhaps test. Um, uh, perhaps if unicorns were real, he'd buy one. But again, that has the same issue. Uh, usually the focus is on the fact that new, because no is a, a trigger. So the fact that no is beside unicorns were real still brings up that same uh, presupposition, but then you have the conditional interacting on it uh, that brings up your confusion, or, or sorry, not your confusion, your concern with that, which is one that I also have a bit of an issue with. Um, but with that issue, uh, the negation and the question will still get the same, uh, the same presupposition triggers across. So the negation and the question will work, uh, even if the conditional is kind of concerning. So yeah, if the conditional is a little bit concerning, you can still just work with a negation and question for now. And we can talk about the conditional some other time if you still have concerns about that. Um, yeah, that's just what I'll say for now. So we don't get too sidetracked uh, for the rest of the 29 minutes. Okay. Um, I, I got uh, one more example of this for the accommodation failure and attitude test. So let's take a look at that. Okay, uh, this one is with the cleft test. And the reason I'm doing this one with the cleft test is because this isn't a presupposition triggering word, it is a syntactic construction that does it. So it was Mary who failed the exam. So in this case, 
it was Mary who failed the exam. We have a noun phrase here. So this presupposes that there is someone who has failed the exam. So again, remember, if we have an A and B here, for our attitude tests, we will be focusing on manipulating A. So for the accommodation test, uh, we could just be silent and accept it, but we could be, uh, you know, we, we could say something instead and we could say, oh, I'm glad it was Mary and not Coco, if we wanna be like that. Uh, or we could fail it and say, hey, wait a minute, what are you talking about? Nobody failed the exam. Why would you say it was Mary who failed the exam when nobody failed the exam at all? Uh, and in this case, I think it is important to just say a reminder here, uh, you're denying the presupposition. So in this case, you're denying B. You're saying that, hold on a second, nobody failed the exam. Uh, someone did not fail the exam, nobody failed the exam. Okay, uh, so those ones, uh, fairly straightforward after seeing the implicature and entailment. So let's take a look at uh, A, B, and C. So I'll just focus on the three main ones here, the declarative, the negation, and the question. I think it is actually best in best interest to leave the conditional out. Um, thinking about it in, in the long run, Usually when you do the presupposition test, you just give me the negation in question anyway. Uh, the conditional is rarely ever given to me in the long run, so it's okay. Uh, it was Mary who failed the exam. So this is your regular sentence A. Um, usually this is good to give, uh, especially when you first start, just so you remember what you're starting with. Uh, just, from, just from my end as an instructor seeing the homework and things. Uh, if you don't give me that first sentence as a declarative, usually what happens is you end up manipulating the wrong sentence and things do not turn out well. So starting with the declarative is just a good thing to do on your homework when you start. Uh, B, it wasn't Mary who failed the exam. Here's your negation. You're doing not A. It wasn't Mary who failed the exam. Well, what does that presuppose? It wasn't Mary who failed the exam. It was someone else. That's still the presupposition. It wasn't Mary. It was Coco. It was someone else. So you're still presupposing someone failed the exam. The question is a little interesting. Uh, was it Mary who failed the exam? You're asking A with a question mark. Was it Mary who failed the exam? Well, it doesn't have to be anyone, but when you ask the question, you're still presupposing that someone failed. Uh, was it Mary? Was it Coco? Was it John? Who was it that failed the exam? So you're still making a presupposition that someone failed. And you can deny this. Was it Mary who failed the exam? Uh, wait a minute, no one failed the exam. So you can still respond no to that question, no one failed. Uh, but the question does presuppose that someone failed. Okay, uh, D, you know, the conditional again, uh, if you do the conditional, you can still get the presupposition, but you might get that, uh, that concern there that uh, someone didn't necessarily fail. Okay, but A, B, and C, for sure, they do presuppose that someone did in fact fail the exam. And regardless of whether it's a declarative, a negative, or a question, uh, whether you change that, you get the presupposition with entailment and implicature, you will not get that. Negation kills entailments, uh, for sure. Questions kill entailments and implicatures. Negations and questions do not kill presuppositions. Okay, uh, I have some practice questions for you, but before you do that, are there any questions about entailments, implicatures, and presuppositions before you run off on your own with those? So for the accommodation test, um, in this case for the club construction, does it have to have another person's name in accommodation or? No, it, it could be silence as well. I just put something down as a response to accept it. Uh, again, in a conversation, normally you just um, accept it and just let the person keep talking. Can you say something like, oh, it's such a pity that Mary failed the exam? Yeah, sure. 
yeah as long as it's something that accepts it and says i i i agree with the i agree with what you said okay um so i have uh four practice questions here on two slides uh just so i have room to write solutions down um if you have the slides on your, oh, I maybe I'll be able to fit both on the thing at one. Oh no, that's awful. Can I do that's too small? Okay, I don't know if I can fit both at once. Um, let's see. I don't know if that's too small or not. Hopefully, that's not too small. Uh, I can give you about six minutes or so to try these out. So that might not be enough time, but uh, just to try these out for now. So the goal of these is to say whether A entails, implies, that's implicature, or presupposes B, and then to use one of the tests uh, to show that there is that inference from A to B. So if you have any questions about them as you go on, feel free to type them in chat or ask over voice, and then I'll go over the solutions after and we can talk about them. So yeah, take a shot at them and we'll come back in five and a half minutes.
Okay. Uh, so not everyone might have finished, which is okay, but we'll just take a look at some of these. Um, so if you did finish them, I put up a little poll on Zoom for each of the questions to see what you got. So I believe that's up for questions 18, 19, 20, and 21. So if you did finish them, you can select entailment, implicature, presupposition, and none for all of them. So please fill those out if you did finish. If you didn't, don't worry about it. I can see how you go. So far, things are looking very, very good for number one. Very good for number two. Very good for number three. And four is exactly what I expected with a nice 50-50 split because of a single word. Okay. So let's talk about some of these. Um, for the sake of the video and for people out here, I will talk about some of them. Uh, the ones that you have done really well, I'll talk about very fast. Not sure about two because of the word realized. Okay, yeah, let's talk about these. Um, one is entailment. Uh, you can use this or you can see this from the contradiction test. So if we take A and not B, we get uh, Julio and Betty are married but Betty is not married. This is really weird because of course, if Julio and Betty are married, then Betty has to be married. So Julio and Betty are married guarantees the truth that Betty is married. So the fact that A is true means B has to be true. So that's entailment. Uh, A entails B. So good job. Uh, most of you got uh, one correct. Uh, also, what I said um, if you do A and B, so I said if you did A and B, it would be a little weird, right? For entailment. So here's what happens when you do A and B with entailment. It's weird. Julio and Betty are married. In fact, Betty is married. It's very redundant. It sounds odd in English. So when you have entailment between A and B, and then you do A and B, it sounds very redundant and very weird. So that's not a really great test for entailment, but it's a way to check uh, to see if you have entailment. It's sort of like a backup. Uh, it just sounds odd. Uh, Ken is a brown and white dog. In fact, Ken is brown and white. Uh, uh, Fido is a brown cat. In fact, Fido is a cat. Oh, it's just weird. Okay. I realize that Tiffany got a good job. Uh, this is a presupposition. Uh, you can do a failure test. I realize that Tiffany got a good job. Uh, wait a second. Tiffany didn't get a job. Uh, I realize that Tiffany got a good job. Yeah, great. Of course she did. She's a great worker. It's accommodation. But you can negate it. Uh, I did not realize that Tiffany got a good job. Well, she got a good job. Yeah, I didn't realize that she got a good job, but she did. I just wasn't aware yet. Uh, you can turn it into a question. Uh, it's, it's a little weird to ask, did I realize that Tiffany got a good job? But if you change the subject, uh, did you realize, sorry, did you realize that Tiffany got a good job? It sounds a little bit better. I mean, it's perfectly okay to say, did I realize that Tiffany got a good job? But this presupposition is still there, that Tiffany got a good job. So can uh, you also say, did you know that Tiffany got a good job? Uh, well, in this case, the word is realize, so we want to use the word realize. Um, okay. Yeah. But, but you could say you instead of I, just to make it a little bit less weird here, that would be okay. Um, but I, I is preferred. Um, 
you might want to, I don't know, pretend you're high or something. Maybe that makes the context a little bit better. Uh, but I don't know. This is like a question of self-realization or something. Uh, then, of course, you could do the conditional or something here as well. But the negation in question would be enough here. And, and the failure test, of course, here is too. Like, hey, wait a minute. Tiffany didn't get a, Tiffany didn't get a job. Uh, so the the reason I was or the reason I am still confused about this is because um, I, like there's a reading of this where you can say I realized that Tiffany got a good job entails that Tiffany got a good job because like you might not be able to actually realize something that is false. It depends on the definition of the word realize, doesn't it? Um, there's like different like different ways of interpreting it and different like kinds of epistemology where where well know, i'm it, it's kind of like the word no right like realize is sort of like to become aware of knowledge so well, yeah but there's 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 forms of knowing like in in like a um uh in like a i'm, I'm forgetting the word right now but like a constructivist kind of epistemology is like you, you could know things that are not necessarily accurate to the world as long as they're coherent in your knowledge in your like information network and and like some people consider that a form of knowing i don't think that they're correct but that is like a a, a kind of epistemology okay i'm not too familiar with epistem like like advanced epistemology um like or much epistemology so um i can't really say much about that uh all I really know about this is that realize and knowledge, or the words realize and know are treated quite similarly um, for us. And that when you say that, I realize that Tiffany got a good job, it can be treated much like I know that Tiffany got a good job. In that case, you just assume that Tiffany got a good job could be true, but that it might also not be true in this case. Uh, Okay, I've yeah, I've, I've done too much philosophy. The, the word no is very ambiguous for me. Uh, yeah, yeah. So we're uh, yeah, we're just treating it very, very simply in this case. Uh, we don't want to think too deeply about this stuff. Um, in an advanced semantics course, uh, you can think about conditionals and epistemology in a lot deeper sense. Um, not in three twenty four, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, if Tiffany got a good job, uh, so how would you form the conditional for this example? Um, if I realized that Tiffany got a good job, um, then I would support her or something. So Bradley was very close, but we do it with the A sentence instead of the B sentence. So if I realized that Tiffany got a good job, then I'd say something. Okay, uh, 20. 20 was done very well. So 71% of people got this one right. This was implicature. So you can do uh, A and not B. So not everyone will get the, will get the answer, um, but someone will, sorry. This is just A and B. So this is uh, reinforcement. So this is just taking A and B, and I'm, I'm abbreviating this quite heavily so I can fit this on the screen here. Uh, and then you can do uh, A, A and not B, so you can cancel it. Uh, not everyone will get the answer. In fact, no one will. So uh, someone will would be the affirmative, and then no one will would be, but not someone will get the answer. So not someone is the same thing as no one. So both of these are acceptable. Um, not everyone will get the answer, but someone will, and not everyone will get the answer, but no one will. Uh, the idea is that if I say not everyone will get the answer for this on the first try, it implies that someone will, but it's possible that no one will. And for 21... Uh, is it presupposition? For 21, it is none of them, and it's because of the word believes. Uh, so if we do the attitude test, we get Arsh does not believe that crocodiles are the same as alligators. So there's nothing about this sentence that presupposes that crocodiles are the same as alligators. It does not believe that crocodiles are the same as alligators. 
So nothing here says for sure that there's any assumption that crocodiles are the same as alligators. Uh, it's not the same as the word no. If he says Arsh does not know that crocodiles are the same as alligators, you make an assumption that they're the same. But here all, all I'm saying is that Arsh does not believe that they're the same as alligators, which is true in the real world. They're, they're not the same. Uh, so the words belief and no are different in that respect, where knowledge assumes truth about the world, but belief doesn't assume truth about the world. Belief is just about what you think in your own head. Um, so this was... Uh, this was just a, a minor thing in thinking about uh, the words belief and no. So in this case, it was not, and this was very close in the polls. Okay, uh, we don't have much time left, so I'll have to finish some stuff on Friday, but I will talk about one more thing. Um, before that, though, are there any questions about these four exercises? Okay, um, so, okay, so I'll just, actually, okay, so what I'll do instead is I'll talk about the assignment, and then on Friday, I'll talk about um, ambiguity, we'll skip the practice exercises, and I'll post the solutions to those online, because I don't think I have any questions that talk about ambiguity uh, on the assignment anyway. Uh, and then we'll start with the other lecture on Friday. So that's how that will work. So let me switch over to the assignment. Okay, so this will be due one week from today. This is the shortest one in the course. There's only three questions and you can do uh, everything from today. So uh, the instructions are the same on every single assignment. Um, Please answer everything on a separate sheet of paper. Um, I know some of you can use your software and fit all the solutions on the same page, but it is very hard to leave comments on feedback when everything is squished together. So please answer it on a separate piece of paper. Uh, you can handwrite it, do a PDF, type it. Uh, I don't care what medium you use, just uh, a separate piece of paper on Canvas. Um, you can use point form, full sentences, paragraphs, whatever you want, I, I don't. I don't care. Just convey your answers as concisely as you can. And uh, groups of up to three people is fine. Individually in pairs or three people, uh, one copy per group, just make sure all your names are on it. Uh, I will upload your feedback to everyone in the group individually. You'll all get the same comments. You'll all get a copy of your feedback. So as long as your names are on it, you'll each get the same response. Um, that's the nice thing about Canvas. So you'll have, yeah, just three questions this week. Uh, first one is about inference types. So in the practice questions we just did, we just did A to B. On yours, you have to do A to B and B to A. Usually it's just one direction, uh, but you'll have to check A to B and B to A for entailment, implicature, and presupposition. Uh, what I'll mention is sometimes you can have entailment and presupposition in the same direction because entailment is about what logically must be true based on the content of the sentence and presupposition is what must be true based on the, or no, sorry, what the speaker takes for granted is background knowledge. So sometimes you can have both presupposition and entailment. So if you do a test and you think, hey, it could be both, there's a good chance it is both. Uh, so if I'm highlighting something and saying that at the same time, it's just coincidence. Uh, so that's one question. Uh, question two is about presuppositions. Uh, the wording might be a little confusing. So basically you have one sentence here, Sam returned to school to get another degree. And this presupposes either A or B. 
So it's either one presupposes A or one presupposes B. You have to choose which one and then prove it using the tests. So I prefer the attitude test. Um, the attitude test is gonna be much easier than the failure or accommodation test to prove your solution, so use that. And then three is just a nice little thing about contradictory sentences. And that's gonna be uh, assignment one, which is due on May 25th, uh, right before class. So there's no understanding and extension questions this week. Uh, what I t will tell you though is by next or assignment two, there will be two questions about um, presuppositions and entailments that are a little bit more challenging, a little bit more involved, but that's why you have these ones first to get used to them in a more uh, straightforward environment before you get more involved. So on assignment two, you'll have to uh, look at presuppositions in a legal environment and you'll have to look at entailment in terms of like uh, hierarchies with verb phrases and also with um, uh, hypernyms and hyponyms. So like how furniture, table and things like that, uh, how we talked about last week and you'll see more instructions then. Um, but yeah, that's it for this week. So if you have any questions, you can stick around other than that. Uh, I'll see you Friday and yeah, feel free to ask on the discussion board or email if you have any questions. So for the first question, if it's both of them, then do we need to write both? Yeah, uh, if it is both, you would write both and show the uh, tests for both. And enjoy the rest of your day. For presupposition, just use one test. Um, if you're going to use just one test, use the attitude test. <laughs>